So hello everyone, it's good to see you. Welcome to the December edition of the IGRI Research Seminar. This is the final seminar for 2021, but no worries, we'll be back next year with more uh, seminars. To, uh, my name is Uta Brady. I'm a visiting scholar at Arizona State University, and I'm also IGRI's Associate Director. Today we're going to be welcoming Dr. Leander Bindef uh, Bindewald, I'm sorry, as our guest speaker. Um, Leander holds a PhD in economics from the University of Lancaster and also has master's degrees in both neuro neurobiology and philosophy business from the University of Freiburg, Freiburg in Germany. For the past 10 years, he's worked on the topic of currency diversity as a consultant and advocate in various countries in Europe, Asia, and North America. He's also worked as a senior researcher for the New Economics Foundation on issues related to a post-growth economy and sustainable economic systems. And currently, he is working in many areas as an independent consultant on collaborative processes and complementary currencies. He also works as a freelance process designer, facilitator, and consultant for complementary currency research. And he's a speaker and coach for monetary literacy. So in short, Leander knows a lot about currencies. And he's truly an academic practitioner. And we're very excited to feature his research today. So Leander, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, thanks again for the invitation. This is a really great opportunity to get back into this um, research topic that I've kind of left dormant for three years. We just talked about that um, before people joined. Um, three years ago, I was finishing my PhD and grammar for institutions really came to me quite late in the process of the PhD as well, and just seemed like a perfect fit for what I wanted to find out with the PhD. Um, yeah, and back then it was, uh, was a bit scary because I couldn't find many references. I only had that original paper and thought oh, that sounds lovely for what I wanted to do, but I didn't really know if what I intended to do was legit <laughs> using that methodology even. And my supervisors didn't know about it. Um, so I have published one paper from my PhD earlier this year. And the part that I'm going to present on today, I hope to put into a paper this winter. Um, so this is also why I'm really happy to present now and I'm happy to take the opportunity to actually ask you guys questions and have a bit of a conversation about this afterwards, um, just in, in terms of helping that publication to get out and be robust. Um, I'm going to share my presentation now, which is very similar to the one I gave in the inaugural um, conference. Um, I don't know how many people here have been um, at that conference and saw that before. I remember I was a bit short of time and left out a few stories and side notes and stuff. So today there's more time, which is really great. Um, and also we have enough time for you to interrupt me whenever there is a question or something is not clear. And we can clarify that right away. And I'm trying to leave enough time for conversation afterwards. So the, the whole thesis was called the grammar of money, which was play on words with the grammar of institutions. Um, it wasn't only using the grammar of institutions, I also did from my my then and current work on complementary currencies, I did a lot of um, basic investigations on complementary currencies and the diversity of money and currencies. Um, and after the research or the um, analysis I did with the grammar of institutions, the findings that I'm going to present um, now, I also turned towards more legal research and went to the US and worked with some lawyers there to look at the laws around money and currency, federal laws in the US and in California in particular, which afterwards I realized I could have done with the grammar of institutions as well. And that might have been maybe a more conventional field to apply this in. But it was really more basic, but also more, more non-basic to many scholars in the field to really just read the laws around money critically and word by word and see if my findings from the Bank of England publications were reflected in the laws or vice versa. I will get to this in a minute. So here this is about applying the grammar of the two institutions to statements by the Bank of England about what money is. So my whole thesis, if you had to put it into a very short sentence, was about what money is, ontology of money, 
um, not how money is used in finance and not about complementary currencies um, in particular, but really just looking what that thing money is in our world and how it is described and defined by different institutions and by practice. Um, just because also from the introduction and me being a consultant in that field, I often find myself having to clarify first that I do not do financial consultancy or financial advocacy or, or research. Um, for me, it's about money kind of in terms of finance being what you do with money, but this is about what money is and kind of monetary literacy, understanding what this money thing in general is and how it then can be used and changed and adapted and understood. That's that's what I normally do. Well, here we go. So this is very brief um, table of contents. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about money as an institution. Um, then the second part is really about the um, analysis I did on um, Bank of England publications and statements. And the third part, now different from the inaugural presentation, will be more reflections and questions. Um, more conversational than me presenting <laughs> reflections and questions. So um, money as an institution is in monetary literature quite a common concept. A lot of people say, yes, money is an institution. And then they have some no reference at all and some um, very diverse references. But John Searle is of, often a foundational reference for many people because he described institution social facts um, in, in a quite general philosophical way. And many people use his publications to um, foster their statement that money is an institution and can be understood as an institution. Um, curiously, John Searle often uses three examples in his in his writings. First is baseball. He's I think he, he was in California at the time. I think he still is. The second is government. And then the third being money. It's quite curious to observe and that could be part of that paper coming out, and I did that in my PhD a little bit, that even in his writings, when he used money as an example, it seemed that he poorly understood what current monetary practices actually are, what that money that we today use, in his case, the dollar, how that is actually created, what the predominant forms are, who's involved, and if you say institutions are a set of rules and um, changing uh, well, um, influencing our behavior, he didn't seem to be quite clear on who's actually setting rules and whose behavior is coming into play there in which form. That changed a little bit um, in the course of his writing. So 10 years after this book that um, not actually with this book, it had already changed a little bit in 2010 by 2005. Around then for him, money was basically notes and coins, and that's what he talked about, then he seemed to have understood the idea that there is money that is not notes and coins, and it's actually not so related to notes and coins as people would think. Um, then he had to describe how social facts come to be that don't have any material or tangible elements to it. And then he came a little bit closer to how money is today, in fact. Um, because today, of course, there are notes and coins, um, and that, those are the iconic things. If you Google money, you will see dollar notes. Um, but of course, electronic forms of money are the predominant form in the world in any country. Well, in, in economies that depend on black and gray markets, cash is um, more predominant, but in any organized economy, it is electronic currencies. And the curious thing that he might or might not have known at the time also is that these electronic units are not um, emitted, created, issued by central banks, but they are created by commercial banks when they issue a loan to people. That is something that when I started in this field was um, a very heterodox view and a lot of scholars and economists and commentators were actually arguing against this, that that can't be right and it's not right and there is um, there are the reserves in, in commercial banks that are from the central bank, and that's what all the electronic money is based on. But today, the consensus basically is that, yes, commercial banks are creating money in forms of electronic units that they weirdly and confusingly still call deposits, because there's nothing deposited ever. It's created by them when they create a deposit. Um, but that is coming from commercial banks, pretty f independent of how many reserves they have and how much cash is in their vault and how much cash their clients have. Um, that has very well, well, has really changed in the academic field as well over the last 10 years. 
Um, and just just to create the whole picture, then of course there are types of money that are, have nothing or little or to a varying degree something to do with conventional money. I call them complementary currencies. A lot of people know them as community currencies, local currencies, regional currencies. Of course, um, also in that time time um, period from 2009 onwards, a lot of people or most people have heard about cryptocurrencies, which to me are a subset of complementary currencies. So just other forms of money that people use or can use or want to use. Um, and there have always been complementary currencies parallel to conventional money all throughout history in paper form. Of course, it's easiest also in this complementary field to show them in their paper forms, but most complementary currencies are purely electronic and that's not only the cryptocurrencies. Um, any, any, most community currencies are just run on a very simple computer server um, somewhere centrally managed, but in purely electronic form. And being steeped in that field and working with a lot of practitioners on the ground um, gave me a very different look on money per se. And when I worked in London at the New Economics Foundation and the big EU project we were running then um, had one of the aims of actually taking this idea that money could be done very differently and taking that idea to um, the public sector and to policymakers and to local governments. We also had to engage with the Bank of England quite a lot and had personal conversations with them. We asked them about legal issues mostly. Um, is a local form of money legal or not in, in which boundaries and with which rules? And they equally asked us a lot of questions about what that actually is that is going on on the ground there. Um, back then, 2009, 2010, they first took note of local currencies, also in their paper form, because there they had an issue with if people confused this with pound sterling, um, what would that, what would the effects on pound sterling be? And then once Bitcoin basically became really popular and prominent, um, everybody asked them questions about what is Bitcoin? Is that legal? Is that money? Is it not money? And then the flow of questions and answers were quite equal between the Bank of England and the New Economics Foundation in terms of what do you think what this is and what it should be and how that should be regulated, which then also took me with my PhD, which came afterwards to um, to the Bank of England publications, because even just reading them attentively revealed a lot of weirdness. And then in my PhD, I, I tried to get to the bottom of this a bit more and make analyze this in a robust form, which then took me to the gram of institutions. But um, what is also important to bear in mind for all of this is that there are pervasive myths, I call them here, about money. Um, the dominant for, um, myth, so to say, is that money has something to do with gold. Like if, if you look into children's books, even textbooks for children, even financial literacy books, when, they, when money is first introduced, it's always the gold coin that first shows up. And a kind of ridiculous, um, effect of this that and then also shows the threatbareness of this is if people depict Bitcoin, even major publications even today still show Bitcoin as golden coins. Of course, it has nothing to do with each other. And it's just it's just a very interesting narrative to bear in mind when doing um, well language analysis of any kind in this field. And we'll get back to this later as well. So how does this matter in this context of regulators and central banks as well? Um, this first sentence is actually from one of the publications that first shook the economics and banking um, scene when the Bank of England first admitted that, yes, we don't do your money, commercial banks create this. And there was one paper called Money Creation in the Modern Economy, and this is where this sentence is from. And then there was a paper called Money in the Modern Economy, where they actually tried to explain what money is. And I'm, um, looked at this a lot in my in my PhD. But in the second one, this is kind of the summary of the position saying, despite its importance and widespread use, there's no universal agreement on what money actually is, which was also in its own right quite revealing for a central bank to say that. Um, and we'll get back to this with the findings of my research, then maintaining confidence in the currency is a key role of the bank and one which is essential to the proper functioning of the economy is the bank's reiteration of their mission. And they, they, their mandate is to ensure that people trust the pound sterling and thus are willing to use it today and in perpetuity. So um, only again in the last 10, 15 years, 
now we speak about the Bank of England in particular, but they kind of took on a different role and mandate also as an educator, as to make the whole economy more transparent and more understandable to people. They use different formats, they published texts that were more excessively written and made YouTube clips about it. The museum in London is quite entertaining, if you like. So they took on this role of an educator on the one side and on the other side there, we still had to maintain people's trust in the currency, which I'm kind of, um, it's, a, it's a, um, a spoiler in a way, which um, is actually in conflict with each other if you look at it at, in, in depth. So this is a screenshot one, of one of those YouTube clips that they produce when trying to make the topic more accessible. It's actually the summary video for these papers that I was just, these bulletins as they call it, David, um, that I was just talking about. So this is the explainer video summarizing what the paper says. So basically this paper, Money in the Modern Economy says on every page, it says money has nothing to do with gold or today's money has nothing to do with gold. Um, if, if you would go about it more psychologically or something, it is of course remarkable that on every page the word gold appears in this paper and probably doesn't help to dissociate people's impression with that word and that image. But more weirdly to, to explain this, they go down into the vault of the Bank of England and shoot the video with this background. Now, if you actually speak to the people there, and I actually spoke to this very person, they, they are very happy and quick to admit that the Bank of England doesn't own any gold. This is not the Bank of England's gold. This again, because it has nothing to do with the money they issue either. They're just um, safeguarding this for other people, for other governments, for other individuals, for other banks. Um, they, they, they always, I always quote this sentence because it was so iconic. They say, we have one billion, it's in the museum and you can touch it. So they only own one of them and it has nothing to do with money. And yet this is how they try to explain to people what money today is or should be. So coming from there, um, I wanted to really see how the Bank of England actually defines money. Of course, saying nobody really knows um, doesn't take them off the hook because to make regulations, to make statements and commentary and to also um, they, they have legal implications, particularly for complementary currency um, practice, practitioners, because if you start a new currency, you kind of have to get an okay from the Bank of England. And they're never going to say you are legal, but you have to declare what you're doing and hope they do not immediately say you're illegal. Just leave, they leave it in the gray area, that's common practice. So at any moment they could revert on their own verdict. Um, but for that, it's of course very important what they actually think on money and what they, how they look at money. So I wanted to find out the Bank of England being such a leading watchdog, not only in the UK, but um, by example for a lot of other central banks as well. Um, how this vagueness um, and these, these antiquated images that they use to explain money, how that actually comes out in their written statements and in their kind of referenceable um, views on this. So from, from these two starting points, them being really important and on the surface, their conversation or their, their um, statements about money being rather vague. I wanted to know how exactly do they define money and currency? And I'm using these two words, of course, because they are cl uh, closely linked and because from the complementary currency practice, the word currency is also really important to understand. Um, second question was, are the definitions based in legal authority? Like, are there actually laws behind what they say? And this, this is a conversation I personally had with them a lot because our the, the initiatives that we were working with really needed to know if their ideas were okay or if somebody will step in. And the third one was how does their standing influence their speech? Like what is this authority by the Bank of England doing to the way they present their, um, their definitions of money, particularly with these two mandates in mind. One is safeguarding the trust in the currency that they issue, the, the notes. Um, of pounds sterling and the central bank reserves they issue to commercial banks. And on the other hand, having that self-assumed mandate to educate people and to make the whole topic more accessible. As I said, for that, I then fell in th that paper, Grammar <laughs> of Institutions kind of fell into my desk and I thought, oh, that's, that might be a good way. And of, of course, I was particularly enthused uh, with these two sentences from the paper saying no scientific field can advance far if the participants do not share a common understanding of the key terms. Um, and that, of course, in economics would be money, one of these key terms that seems to be so poorly understood. 
And then the other statement being the rigor and the logic based system disciplines discourse by making inconsistencies more apparent. And that is basically what I wanted to do with the PhD, having the impression from this publication that it is kind of vague and inconsistent if this can actually be shown in a rigorous with a rigorous methodology. Um, that second sentence, just going back to this, um, making disciplines discourse, of course, was another trigger for me going like, yes, I, I had, have had um, a discourse perspective on the whole field from what I first thought my PhD would be all about um, and for the way I'm seeing money. So that made a lot of sense because money to me is not just an institution, but um, I use a term coined by Vivian Schmidt. Um, it's a discursive institution. So just to give you a bit more on discursive institutionalism, um, it's different from other schools of institutionalism or institutional perspectives, and that is actually puts the focus and is really interested in not what uh, institutions are and how they came about, but also how they change um, as well as bottom up and top down and like by set rules or by practice, if you like. So Vivian Schmidt says discursive institutionalism simultaneously treats institutions as a given, as a concept, or as the context within which agents think, speak and act, and as contingent as the results of agents' thoughts, words and actions, which of course at any moment can divert from the set rules in a given institution and then also change the institution in return. So with the discursive institutionalism framework or um, perspective, the grammar of institutions seem to be a great way to analyze this. Um, so of course, I, I, my PhD had changed halfway through also from doing interviews with people and transcribing them and analyzing them to thinking, oh, it's, it's much cleaner and easier if you only use published publications and text, and which was not to the liking of my supervisors, but much nicer for me, I really don't like describing, uh, transcribing. Um, interviews. So I looked at the um, publications by the Bank of England, um, very accessible through their website, um, great search engine on there. I knew the bulletins that I mentioned earlier already. And of course, there's all the speeches by their governors and um, research articles and everything to be looked at. So this is where I then drew my corpus from and to apply, uh, apply the grammar of institutions. And this is how I went about this. So with the search function on the Bank of England's website, the website, by the way, looks different now. If you actually go to their website, don't be surprised. It's it, this is a screenshot from the website that I then used. I just used their um, search window and um, sorry, now the zoom controls are a bit in the way here. I need to move them away. So I see what you see um, with the search um, um, field. I found uh, 1932 results. Um, for nine terms that I use, for example, money is, currency is, and, and so forth. Um, and the website shows you snippets of them, which has a sample sentence. And I just screened all these 1,900 publications briefly to see if the, the search terms actually made good sense for what I was looking for. And after excluding artifacts in the search and duplicates and and publications like websites and pamphlets that they also show through the website. I selected 60 publications since 1970 and actually my hearsay searched in full text that I did that in Mendeley actually, which I use as my references software and the, search, um, the full text search there works really well. So I actually went again with these search terms through the whole publication and looked if the sentences in which those um, terms appear actually say something about money in, in the way of saying this is how the Bank of England sees money and currency. Um, down in the graph, you see that the statements across these publications really spiked after 2010, which to me wasn't a big surprise because 2012, 13, 14, because of these local currencies also in, in London, the Brixton pound is a quite popular um, example, which is very similar to the Berkshires, for example, in the US, um, the Bank of England started to look into different forms of money and then of course always had to say in comparison what money is and then with bitcoin kind of peaking also in 2012 for the first time a lot of questions were asked and the pandemic bank of england had to say a lot about the issue of money and um, so 
for convenience, I selected 170 statements from, I selected 30 texts which had 170 statements and they all fall between the years 2013 and 2017. Uh, footnote, I haven't looked back into this and seen how, what the Bank of England said about money since, if it's more or less or the same. Um, but yeah, these, these few years contained 80% of all the statements that I found across all the publications of the Bank of England. So I thought that's a good sample. And I um, then did my ADICO analysis on um, those 170 statements. Leander, um, Leander yes? sorry, you wanted me to interrupt, uh, to let you know when 20 minutes are up. Great, thank you very much. So two thirds in, we're finally getting to the meat. Um, I had to do two adaptations, which was is to me still seems like a risky maneuver because um, I didn't know anything about the grammar of institution and couldn't find very much. I just needed to make a few changes so it was useful for me. Um, so money to me is a pluralistic term. It comes in many different forms. Currencies, of course, is very pluralistic. So um, across, the, oops, sorry, that shouldn't, um, across the publication, I already found a lot of compound terms. So broad money, narrow money, cash, um, well, that's not compound, but um, yeah, the, these terms, so it had to be a bit broader than just money and just currencies. And I had to look a whole, across a whole lot of um, different terms. That's the one thing. And the other adaptation is basically because the Bank of England is not just any interlocutor in that topic. They have a very authoritative position. A lot of people look at them and turn to them for answers. So um, I had to kind of come to terms with anything they saying, being kind of authoritative and having a normative um, tinge to it. So here are the two things that I did. I introduced one new passing category, if you like. I call it the explanandum. So what the statement is actually talking about, because it's not only just money or currency. It sometimes talks about banknotes. It talks about broad money. It talks about deposits and, and all these different words. So just to capture this, I um, in my analysis, I also had to be explicit what the statement is actually talking about. So that's the X. And um, the other thing is that um, when the Bank of England just says something, a very brief statement, um, money is this and this, I already, um, it, it has a different weight um, as compared to if you or me say something about money. So with this, some statements I um, added, I inferred some attribute and deontics to it. The attribute being for the bank's audience, it is defined. So because they publish it, they want the audience to take note that this is what they think about money. And the deontic then being it must it and must thus be observed that and then the statement comes. Um, here's an example of that um, in the United Kingdom notes and coins. Uh, sorry, public uh, in public circulation represent only four percent of broad money balances in February two thousand sixteen. Um, the explanandum here, broad money is the term, and I added then for the Bank of England's audiences. It is defined and must be observed that X broad money is notes and coins 4% in the UK in February 2016. And, and these um, hacks, if you like, um, is something that I would love to have some feedback on just to hear if that makes it vulnerable, what I did all together, or if that is uh, legit, if you like. So this is how, how it looked in my very simple Excel sheet. Um, I had all the sentences that I extracted from the publications with the, they, they are all um, numbered and labeled. So the um, publication that it's from is above. And then I split them up into the different um, ADECO elements with um, the X being in that, in, in that um, column by itself, which in the end, I didn't really use for any, any, um, anything other than saying money is a very diverse term, um, but it was kind of important for me to, to be sure and also to see how many different terms they're actually employing to talk about this topic. Uh, yeah, I just highlighted this. So just having a few examples from my analysis um, for the for rules um, and norms and strategies. Here, this being a classic example, so to say, for a rule. Under section so-and-so of the Fortune Quantifying Act, it is a criminal offense, which makes it 
quite deontic or the or else being if you don't observe this you'll be sued for any person without the prior consent in writing of the bank of england being the condition to reproduce any substance whatsoever and whether or not on the correct scale um, any bank of england banknotes or any part of the england banknote so this this um was the easiest one for me to see say uh, to to get from my for my analysis um here quite just to be explicit here the explainer number is banknotes not money per se this being a, a example norm the explainer number here being narrow money <clears throat> people need to have faith that the value of the banknotes being the attribute will remain broadly stable over time this is generally this generally means that the state must ensure Oh, sorry, if I try to get rid of the Zoom controls, it switches. And this generally means that the state must ensure the ontic a low and stable rate of inflation. If there is any questions to this, or if you think this is a bit, bit odd, um, please tell me now. We'll get back to this later anyway. But yeah, to, to figure this out for myself was a bit uh, difficult at the time without knowing anybody who did it and anything else before. And here being just um, an example, sorry, I just I want to click to get rid of the zoom controls, but oh, no, it didn't change. So um, example of a strategy um, with the expander on banknotes again, the Bank of England promises to honor its debt by exchanging banknotes for other of the same value forever. Um, and this is, does this come now? No. So this is one of the, the, the simple strategies. And with the norms, as I said, I have introduced a lot of interfering, interfering, uh, interferred meanings um, for some of the norms. They were, of course, of a much shorter kind were added to the bank's audience, and it must be observed that. But altogether, then, um, the 170 statements, there were 29 strategies, 118 norms, 70 of which, the biggest part of which, with these deferred attributes and the ontics, and only 13 of those rules. Um, I'm, of course, I was a little bit biased with these findings already because having worked so much on money and having helped so many people to get their initiatives and their innovations out and, and into practice, um, I would have assumed there's more rules around this. There's more laws and more regulations that actually make it quite clear. But it turned out that at least from the Bank of England publication, you can't see that there is only 13 rules and most of what they say about money comes in a different form. Um, there's no legal backing for how money is defined is also that I kind of inferred from these only 13 rules out of 170 statements is also reflected in what other people say. Here's one 2017, which was came out on the laws in the UK and by Kate Harrington, who is also a, a legal scholar by training. And I think she works as a barrister as well. Um, but then she said money in law is difficult to define. It can encompass almost every common meaning or it, it may equate to none, which would have been a great starting point. Oh, sorry, click this again, which would have been a good starting point for my thesis, but nobody had said that at the time when I started my PhD so clearly. Um, and the lower um, title down there, inconsistent definition of money and currency and financial legislation as a threat to innovation and sustainability. That's actually the paper of um, uh, the title of the paper that I published earlier this year with this other part of my PhD, where looking then at the laws and regulations in the US also clearly revealed this. There are a lot of definitions, even in law, but for anybody who doesn't assume that they know what they're talking about, they they are totally inconsistent and incoherent and actually sometimes contradicting each other e even in the law text and the lawyers i worked with in the us also said yes you could you could get this through in court saying that has to be changed if only you would find a sponsor because it touches everybody but nobody's really interested in changing these laws so along with this findings of the uh, the distribution of strategies norms and rules in these texts Along with it, I, I, I did, it did also reveal inconsistencies and lo, lo, uh, logical fallacies and contradictions that cannot so easily be expressed um, with the Andico methodology or analysis. But um, looking so closely just revealed them and, and a chapter in my PhD is also about a lot of this. Um, and just to illustrate that a little bit, um, how ah, it happened again. Go away, zoom controls. <laughs> um, 
The Bank of England promises to honor its debt, what we had earlier, by exchanging banknotes for others of the same value forever. If, if you take this as a strategy um, and think, okay, this is what the Bank of England does, but then look at it, what it does in practice, um, which is basically what every banknote in the U UK says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of £10. Um, but then again, the Bank of England, even in public panels and discussions, they're very quick to say, well, this means that if you take this banknote to the cashier in the foyer of the Bank of England, you hand them the banknote, they hand you back another banknote. There is nothing else to this, to this promise anymore other than the promise itself. There is nothing behind this which kind of, yeah, just, just shows, it brings, it shines an interesting light on the whole constitutive situation of money as it is at the moment. Just with a lot of smoke and mirrors, if you like, or mirages, as I then called it in my PhD, which of course um, is easily illustrated with all the gold that is appearing in their publication and their narratives and in their backdrops to their videos. This is, uh, I had this in the inaugural um, presentation again, which is, it's meant as a joke and Terry Pratchett, if you know the author, writes comical novels, but with this one, he kind of, this, this novel is actually recommendable if you want to understand money. And it's a quote from a little conversation there where the, um, the interlocutor there is asked by the protagonist, I would prefer to say that it's a tacit understanding that we will honor our promise to exchange it for a dollar's worth of gold, provided we are not, in point of fact, actually asked to. And then the protagonist says, so it's not actually a promise. And the banker then says, it certainly is, sir, in financial circles. It is, you see, about trust, which is actually how it is today and with, um, with money that we currently use and that we often um, use as if this is money per se. Um, I think it's the next slide. Uh, I, I'll just skip one slide and come to this graph of mine that is also from the PhD, um, where one of the troubles, of course, is that we use the word money to mean something broad and general. It's a concept, it's a platonic idea of money, if you like it, and my PhD describes it as such. And we use the word to refer to the notes and coins in our wallets and the units in our bank accounts. And this um, makes it already a bit difficult to, to tell apart, to tease apart. So as results and implications from my, from my PhD, one is, of course, the very factual and easy one, norms and strategies outweigh rules, even for conventional currency, for dollars and pounds, sterlings and yen and euros. Um, money and currency, the terms are not legally clearly determined. They're, there's a lot of definitions, but they're not clearly determined by these definitions. And one, particular finding looking at conventional money and um, central banks, for example, is that they are not a creature of the state, which a lot of people normally say about money. They are somehow related to the state, but only by the illusion, illusion and by the authority that um, regulators have about definitions. And an implication then is that these current definitions and the way um, regulators and authorities talk about it kind of inhibit innovation and reform in this field. A lot of people call for the financial system to be different. A lot of people say money is a bad measure of things that we value or should value in the world. And um, it really inhibits us to actually create a more sustainable world, the money, the way money is currently used and created. But with these definitions, we're not going to get past this very easily. So this is one of the recommendations for my PhD. And this is basically the end to that part. Um, I recommend to actually not use the word money at all anymore in legal texts and that by implication would go for the Bank of England's publication as well. Um, but actually to only talk about the currency that is in question, so the Bank of England would only talk about pound sterling, the Fed only about dollars, and then you can write any preferential legislation that you want. It's good to protect conventional currencies in a different way or safeguard them or treat them differently from a local, small local currency. But by calling them both things money, of course, limits the scope that other people have in actually changing that or doing something different in that in that every now. I don't see the time anymore. What's how, where are we? Um, you are 36 minutes into your presentation. All right. Okay. So these reflections and questions are actually just questions I'm going to pose for the conversation that we're going to have now. What I'm mostly interested or worried about, also looking at the 
hopefully publication that I wanted to write over this winter is, is this use of the grammar of institutions consistent with the method's intentions as far as you know or you can see? Is my hack those two adaptions um, using the, the explanandum and actually inferring an attribute in the ontic is that a legitimate extension of the methodology? Does the assumption of the bank's authority lead to self-referential self -referential findings, like me saying the, they have an authority and thus I infer the attributes in the ontics um, in my analysis, that kind of um, self-fulfilling um, prophecy, if you like. Um, the other question I have, um, how does this connect with other um, research in the field? Of course, I heard a lot of very interesting things um, during the inaugural conference, but maybe somebody knows something that is more closely related to what I was doing by method or by field of application of this. In my PhD, I really struggled to evidence that this is a robust and um, well-known um, methodology. It would be very different now, but just um, if I if, if I then get to write this paper, just to have a better list of references so people that who never heard about this know that, yes, there's a lot of research being done with this. And then to easy ones, or maybe not so easy, do you know of any journal where this could be more easily published in, or who would be interested in that? Of course, the topic lends itself to business and economics journals. They wouldn't know about the grammar of institutions. Maybe there's other fields where this is um, more interesting, um, more interesting in terms of methodology and outlook. And oh, sorry if there's a big typo in there. I meant, is anybody up for being a co-author? somebody who's more savvy, not sacky, in the grammar of institutions and wants to help me write a robust publication on these terms. And that would be it. I hope I'm not too far over time. Should I stop the, the presentation? Can you remember the questions or, well, I'll do this for now and then I can come back to the list of questions or if people have questions about the individual elements. Sure. Yeah. Oh, you at some point you said my screen is frozen. Did that solve itself? Uh, well, right now it's black. Whoa. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see the chat while I was speaking. There was a, uh, yeah, that's fine. No worries. The slide seemed to advance, but your screen was frozen. And I didn't know if it was just on my end. I just thought I'd let you know. My, my video, you mean? Yeah, sorry. Yes. All oh, right. Video. Well, your video feed was. Nothing to see here. And right now you're on black, but I, I mean, we can hear you, so um, I can open the floor to questions. Is it better now I just stopped and started the video? I can't see you. Ah, how odd. I, I do see myself in the, <laughs> in the gallery. There you anyway, go. You're back. Point. You're back. All right. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have questions or want to respond to the questions that Leanda had? Saba? Um, yeah, so thank you, Leanda, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so I think the adaptations that you made um, seem sensible given your objectives um, in trying to understand these, um, the sort of definitions, if you will, of, of money. I will say that, you know, the recent adaptations that we've made with the IG and the IG 2.0 that actually provides the syntax for constitutive rules, particularly, um, is probably quite helpful <laughs> for your mm -hmm. kind of analysis where it's, 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 it is literally about understanding how things are defined and the various kinds of, you know, descriptors, properties, definitions that we engage. Um, so insofar as you have any interest in sort of, you know, thinking about these, these data uh, with a different lens, I think this could give you um, a really nice uh, framework to work from. But in essence, the adaptations that you made are consistent with what is, it is uh, signaled with the constitutive syntax insofar as the constitutive syntax is giving a place for what you're calling the explanatory Explain, explain them um, 
<laughs> right? Um, now we're just calling that the constituted entity, <laughs> if you will. Hmm. Um, yeah, and, had I known then, I would have not created a new word. Yeah, and and the um, and then the the deontic, um, we're also accommodating that with with something that's more, we think, logically appropriate within the context of. Um, Surla's constitutive uh, framing, um, and we're, we're referring to it as a modal instead of a deontic. Um, but in essence, I'm, I'm giving these examples only to say that your adaptations align with um, many of the modifications that are now captured within this constitutive syntax. Um, and, and that could also be uh, very, yeah. So in any, any, any case, if you wanted to sort of reassess um, with this, uh, it, that could give you some leverage, but I guess um, one question um, that I have for you is is almost like um, a thought exercise, in the sense that can you think of analogous cases to money that um, sort of they're they're because I'm trying to think about money as an artifact, as a social artifact, and why these sorts of trends that you observed might be associated with money in particular. And is there a like kind of artifact that we could think about that might, you know, I don't know, just in general, seem to have similar sorts of definitional kinds of dynamics surrounding them? Hmm. I, another way to say that is like, what is it about what is it about money qualitatively that might beg the kind of results that you observed? I'm not sure, but yeah. <laughs> maybe it helps. I'm, I am using um, examples and analogies on different when people ask this question or when I'm explaining why this is problematic and um, the use of money by the authorities. And I often use an analogy from, um, well, I'm just saying, so So saying pound sterling is money and the concept of money is also money. It's like confusing mm -hmm. a, um, a, a, a local, uh, sorry, a public trans, a bus, a bus right, right. or a commuter train with the concept of transport right. or, um, or using the, concept of identity, confusing the concept of identity with a passport. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, is that maybe, is that, does that get to your first part of the yeah. question? Well, and, I guess I'm wondering, it, I guess there's, the, is there something about me that thinks that like, maybe this is a very useful thing um, to have vague definition insofar as money operationalizes in a variety of ways. It is an. Uh, it is what lawyers often say. Um, all the laws are vague, and we 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 like it this way, <laughs> which is fine. And, which is fine for most cases, um, and it's totally fine for the incumbents at the moment. Because, or say, even very large new entrants. So when Facebook declared their currency, um, Libra, is, um, then they they actually played on these misunderstandings and confusions they actually published wrong definitions of what they are what they said they would be was absolutely not even by the text of the law what they then actually said in the text how they're going to implement it so mm -hmm. for a big company with a lot of lawyers this is great this gray area for a small local initiative without funding and without the, the support that they will need to fight or actually even have that conversation with the Bank of England to get through to them and then find a niche. Yes, yes, yes. This is this is very I and mean, this is kind of sorry, maybe I didn't explain this um, enough beforehand. In in my job in London, I was working with local initiatives who wanted to start a, a very benign, small social local currency. They couldn't dare to because the Bank of England didn't really tell them what's what. So they were always under the threat of the Bank of England turning around and saying, no, actually, you are now illegal because now we changed our mind upon it. The initiative in London that we, that we worked with, the Brixton Pound, before I went to London, they had an okay from the Bank of England to use an electronic currency. Mm -hmm. After Bitcoin then blew up the whole playing field of um, new electronic versions of money, afterwards they were told by the Bank no, you can't do this anymore. Now you have to cease and and, and vanish. And that, of course, is a huge risk for small initiatives. So in that sense, yes, 
if <laughs> you come from also from a position where you say money and currency and financial systems have to change, then this situation is an impediment to actually having bottom-up diversity. You will see different big entrant um, and new players in the field like PayPal and TransferWise and Facebook, if you like, but they're not going to actually implement any new value system. They're just going to have a maybe even worse kind of money than we currently have. Mm -hmm. But that is, of course, a normative position to have. Should have probably explained that a bit better before. And mm -hmm. there's enough references to say a lot of people are demanding the system to change. Mm -hmm. But in that, from my point of view, having vague definitions in this area actually is an impediment to change. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm. yeah, it does. Thank you. Dan and then Carol. Thanks. And first, I just want to, I'm a bit of an interloper here. My invitation was forwarded from a friend who thought I might be interested in this. So uh, I, nice to meet all of you. I'm not a normal in this group. Um, I'm a lawyer and a legal scholar. I work with Chris Dasan at Harvard Law School on the history of money and legal definition of money. And um, I, I have one question, but first, um, uh, Professor Siddiqui, if I'm saying that right, uh, to your question, maybe a comparable phenomenon would be something like company or corporation. And you look at how a security regulator refers to it, because there's lots of various legal forms of a company or corporation, um, not a corporation, but a company. Maybe you, maybe that would kind of track with money, at least if you see it as a legal institution like I do. Maybe that's sort of a comparable thing. Just a thought I had. Um, well, one thing, uh, two questions. I thought this was a great presentation, uh, Leander. Two questions. One was, um, did you think at all about motives behind keeping a vague definition? I know you said some lawyers like it. I'm sure some others don't. Um, you know, there are clearly vested interests behind keeping definitions vague in certain contexts. I definitely think money is one of those. I don't know if you've reflected on that at all <clears throat> in your work. And secondly, I wonder if you looked at all at the definition of a bank. You know, as me, me as a lawyer, I actually find the vague or I would say tautological definition of a bank, at least in American law, less so in Canadian, which is what I study mostly, to be even more problematic mm. the definition of money being ambiguous. Because um, it means, you know, an MMF monetary fund can basically be a bank without ever uh, being regulated as one because they kind of define themselves. Um, just two quick questions. And I, thanks again for letting me interlope on this group. That's not my usual group. I really appreciate the uh, presentation. Dan, sorry, I thought the name sounds familiar. Did you not publish my paper on just money? Yeah, we reposted. We reposted. Yeah. I don't remember if it was this one or a different one, but one of them on. It was, well, it was the one yeah. that I referred to. This part I haven't put into paper form, but um, yes. Um, so thanks for your questions. Um, and the company corporation analogy is a good one. I, I took note of this. Um, so it's different. I a lot of my colleagues would immediately say yes. There is, of course, deliberate um, intention on keeping it this way and creating it this way, and making it this way. Um, it's the banks, it's the bankers and stuff. I, I don't normally do that kind of polarizing. Um, I, in my PhD, I did write a lot about the history of banking also, particularly in the US, because in the when I when I looked at the law in California, you had to really try to understand when these laws were written and why and by whom. And the history of money and the history of banking goes hand in hand there. And it was another very curious thing to observe. I don't think you said that, but in the US, basically, bank is defined as a company doing banking. That's what the law actually says, as ridiculous as that is. And all the big banks in the US were um, transport companies hauling stuff across and then ditched all of that business and went into banking because that was more lucrative once. Well, anyway, several factors, but um, so um, if you look at it historically and see how it grew, there were always vested interests and there were always practices dominated by big players that then created the scene for which laws were written. Um, Today, as I said, maybe you know the the sustainable law, um, sustainable economics law center in Oakland. Um, it's um, Janelle Orsi. I was working with them when I did that part of my PhD. They said yes, <laughs> but what you could show here in the law is actually inconsistent and wrong, and it should be changed. And if you found a sponsor in the in the um, 
sorry, the Parliament of California. Sorry, I forgot what that is actually called. Um, if you would find a sponsor, you could put a case through. They did on a very small matter, they get a case through um, like this, where definitions were over, um, were too old and they made sense at the time, but not anymore. But yeah, you don't, you don't find a sponsor so easily for this, which also has a lot to do with um, the banking sector now having the biggest lobby in any governmental center in the world. And um, it would be against the best interests of most politicians to um, wake sleeping dogs, as we say in German. I don't know if that translates into English. So that, that is, there is a big problem with this at the moment. And the, with the Bank of England focus, it, was, it is really curious that they have these two hats on saying we want to educate people, but at the same time, for our other men, that it's actually really good if it remains vague, because otherwise, once people wake up to the idea that it's just a mirage and that there's nothing behind these 10 pounds other than the promise, it might be a bit risky for our main objective of keeping it exactly the way it is. Um, did I answer both your questions? Mm, yeah. yeah, I think you did. But sorry, just to say this would sharpen my my issue here is like with the grammar of institution, what I did here, does that actually help to highlight the situation that shall be changed? Or is this too far out a methodology and approach to take to actually make this a more robust case to people who might not naturally follow this line of argumentation? Are you asking the forum? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> also, seeing there's officially only three minutes left to this, um, maybe I'll cut back to the other two questions. Like, if anybody would like to co-author a paper on this, research is done, just needs more robust framing. <laughs> well, so what I think Cleander is really interesting. So I think it's um, so what I what's what's interesting to me about this kind of case is it's an object that's being defined. And uh, in essence, right, uh, like so money. Well, if object, you don't take it too much realistically, <laughs> as opposed to, for example, an actor or mm. a position or something that inherently has some sort of agency associated with it. The mm -hmm. agency of uh, the agency that links to this object is coming from uh, is, is linked to the actors that have some capacity to act in relation to it. So, um, it, it, so in some sense, it seems, so that's why I was kind of interested in this idea that this is like a social artifact. Like we, when we think about, you know, um, the original IG with the attributes, deontics, aims, conditions, et cetera. I mean, it is really focused on um, characterizing the role of the actor um, that's doing something. But in, in your case, absent the grammar, original grammar's ability to accommodate constitutive kinds of statements, which essentially are what you're capturing with definitions, um, you're, you're basically um, thinking about this uh, with reference to attributes, but actually the attributes are, are the bank. Um, and in these other financial in institutions that essentially act on this a social artifact. So I think um, what could be interesting as a framing would be to leverage the grammar for the definitional aspects, like the definitional qualities, allow you to see fundamentally how this is um, characterized and defined and speak to the implications of that. But furthermore, to use the grammar to really characterize the um, the roles and responsibilities of actors that essentially mm. act on money. Because in all of the cases and examples um, that you described, I mean, what was really fascinating is um, the discretion that the bank was exercising in determining, um, right, uh, kind of almost like in a judicious way, <laughs> it, it, judicious in a judicial kind of sense, um, how money was going to be interpreted within particular settings. And to that effect, I just think it would be really fascinating to kind of map out the, the roles and responsibilities of different actors that essentially mm. have control over how the definition gets interpreted within different settings and in relation to different potential reforms, et cetera. Does that make any sense? 
given what you're interested in? <laughs> to totally, because I, I did that for complementary currencies, not with the grammar of institutions, but with um, cultural historic um, activity theory. Um, I yeah. just used that. Do you know that? No, oh. no, no. I'm just okay. Yeah. No, it was all new to me, anyways. But so I used <laughs> this one to actually um, tease out how a complementary currency is actually set up, what the different roles and actors are, and what the different rules are that they set, and what the objects are. The object is actually used in that um, framework as well. And at the end of that chapter, when I applied that to five different complementary currencies, of course, I said, and it would be interesting to do that on con conventional money, but it would it's huge because there are so many actors um yeah so yeah. i kind of shied away from this and really just focused on that one element of saying look mm -hmm. the regulators don't know what they're talking about the law doesn't know what they're talking about so obviously there is an opportunity to open this up for mm -hmm. other actors and innovators well and then the phd was done and i moved on to other things so <laughs> <laughs> I kind of left it there. Yeah. yeah, that's how it goes. Um, I would encourage you, Leander, also to consider maybe, I don't know if you've signed up to the EGRI listserv, but you could put a call out through the listserv if you're interested in collaborating with others who are interested in this topic. That might mm. be a way to connect with others. And Dan, I also wanted to say you're not an interloper. Newcomers are always welcome and we hope you come back. Definitely. <laughs> and bring friends. And present. Thanks. <laughs> and present, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank just you. Before so every, just before everybody signs off and we say goodbye, I just uh, put a link into the chat, which um, you can download my PhD from there. It's a lot of boring methodology, but there is to the question that Dan asked and to Zava, what Zava asked and this other thing that I use to analyze institutions like this, um, you'll find that in the PhD. Yeah, I'll put that link in with the video of this presentation, Leander, so that people can access it even afterwards. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting work, Leander. Mm -hmm. We're glad to have you. And thank you everybody for attending. I hope you have a happy holiday and we'll see you back in January for our next research seminar. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> Bye.